Well, good morning, everybody. I hope that whatever has been happening to you and your family over the last week, you've been uh, well, safe, and once again, enjoying this beautiful sunshine. I'm so looking forward to, being sh uh, to be able to share with you some thoughts from God's word, and thank you for allowing me the privilege of doing so in your own home. Thanks, Emma, too, for that great talk. We really do appreciate all the work that you've put into the children's and families ministry at this time. It's such a blessing to so many. And that story of Hannah and Samuel is an important reminder to all of us that each and every child is a wonderful gift from God and that every child can be used by God and can serve him. It's a story that goes to the heart of what it means to know the joy of an earthly family, but also as parents, how we have to honour God as he blesses us within his family. Now today, of course, is Father's Day. For many of us, it's a happy day, a day to celebrate and give thanks. Dare I say, a day to spoil your dad. But I also recognise that everyone's experience of family and family life is very different. For some of us, Father's Day might be painful. For some of you, there will be memories of a father who was once with you but is now no longer. For others, we may not even know who our father is. And for others of you, you will very well know who your father is, but your memories of him are not that good. My dad was a, a war child born in the Second World War in his parents' home. He grew up in a small town close to the sea in Essex. His mother was one of seven children, his father was one of eight. They married in later life and just had my dad and his sister. His mother was before she was married in service. She started at 14, cleaning, serving and cooking in other people's homes. And his dad was a storesman in the bus company and later the hospital. My dad left school at 16 with good qualifications, but whilst working, he put himself through night school to get higher qualifications. For 45 years, he's one of the hardest working men I knew, working his way up through the ranks of local government and he became a chief executive. He served faithfully at church as well, adding many more hours onto already uh, long work hours at the office. He loves my mum and he's given her all that he could and he gave my sister and myself the best of opportunities. He's now retired and he lives with my mum in a flat by the sea. He's never let us down, never let my mum down and always been there for us and I'm so, so thankful for him. So given that I'm so thankful for my dad, why on earth would he and I be grateful that I'm adopted into another family? You could be forgiven that I'm, I'm mad, but it's true. As much as I love my dad and as much as he loves me, my dad knows and I know that being adopted into God's family is the best thing that can ever happen to you. But this really does need explaining, doesn't it? So this morning, we're going to take a look at a passage in the Bible from a book called Romans. Romans is a letter. It's a letter written to people that the writer had not even met, but it's a letter full of passion about what we call the gospel or the good news. Initially, it starts out with some pretty bad news, and it's brutal and honest about this world. A world that God had created, but in which relationships went badly wrong. And Paul describes in this letter the human race and the world that we, in which we live in that, that needs to be fixed. And it's from that background the letter writer Paul goes on to introduce this good news of Jesus Christ. Paul tells us who Jesus is and what he has done to help fix this problem. And then at the very heart of the letter, we come to a passage that we're going to be looking at today. In our Bibles, it's called Romans chapter 8. This part of Paul's letter tells us the best news ever. Paul says that because of what Jesus has done, because of Jesus and those who put their trust in Jesus, we do not need to fear any condemnation from God. And more than that, we've been adopted into God's family. It really is one of the most glorious pieces of writing in the history of the world. But amazingly, it's not just a historical letter that has no bearing today. No, its power continues even now. So this morning, we're going to read just a small part of that chapter. And then having read it, I hope to encourage you to really get to grips with this huge word, adoption. By understanding how huge it is, my prayer is that you will discover your forever home in a broken and hurting world. Adoption really is a word to celebrate. But before we move to the Bible, I just want to highlight this book. It's called The Greatest Secret. And in the next 20 minutes, I hope to unpack some of what this word adoption means for Christians. But if you want to explore it more, then can I really encourage you to read this new book by Chris Kandaya. Chris writes it in a really easy and understandable style with some great illustrations. They're illustrations that come from his own personal experiences around adoption. 
Now much of what I'm going to be talking about, he goes into far greater depth and it really is an inspirational read. So let's go back to God's word and read together Romans chapter 8 verses 14 to 17. For those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. The Spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather the Spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. So let's pray. Our loving Heavenly Father, we thank you for these words which were written 2,000 years ago by the inspiration of your Spirit. We pray by the inspiration of the same Holy Spirit that you would help us to receive what you have us have for us this morning, the light of the gift of the Lord Jesus Christ, whose life, death and resurrection gives us all that we need. In your name. Amen. Well, a question for you. When I say the word adoption, what do you hear? What goes in your mind? What image does it conjure up? It may be that you're transported to some film that you've seen. Maybe Despicable Me or Annie with that immortal line, it's a hard knock life for us. Or for some of you, it will be very personal. Maybe you've been adopted yourself, or maybe you've been someone that has adopted a child. Maybe you just know about this word, but have not actually experienced it in your own wider family. My own experience of adoption has been through my work as a a lawyer. I've been involved in uh, in the actual legal process and advising those who want to adopt. I've also had the opportunity of reflecting on what adoption means to people working in the legal profession, including a number of judges. Now, when we think of the law courts, we often imagine a sombre occasion, the judge dressed in black robes, wearing a funny wig, people fighting amongst themselves or in trouble with the law. And then the final judgment is given by the judge. However, when you speak about adoption to a judge, it's often the one time when their face just lights up they will tell you it's just the best day at court when you do a final adoption hearing. A judge once described it to me like this. There's a buzz of excitement. The family are gathered together with a child and this family rather than being at odds with one another they're full of anticipation about what's about to happen. There's a joy in the room. Now once those legal formalities are over very often I will ask the family to come and join me with the child. I'll explain to them just what a happy day like this is. When most of my work involves pain, discord and animosity, an adoption just makes my week. Now it's not often that you hear judges celebrating. Now whilst there is often pain in the process of adoption because of a family breakdown, a death of a parent or a situation of neglect, that very final hearing when the child is adopted into a new family is one of great joy, of great celebration. The judgment's not one of condemnation. No, it's a judgment of happiness and joy. A new relationship has begun. Not just a legal relationship, but a relationship of love, of care, of provision, the desire to do the best for that child. But why on earth does the Bible use such a word? Well, the Christian message is very much the same. Paul uses the adoption word five times in a number of letters, including the one we read in Romans. He does so to help us understand that rather than judgment of separation and death that we deserve, the judgment we receive is totally different. It's one of acceptance, acceptance because of adoption. We become members of a new family, we're taken in, accepted as sons and daughters of God. In those verses that we've just read, Paul expresses it this way. For those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. The Spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship, and by him we cry, Abba, Father. So my first point this morning is that from a Bible perspective, adoption changes the way we view ourselves and family. Now there always has been a perfect family, even before the world was created. We believe as Christians that God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit always been living in perfect harmony as a family in perfect love. And it was through this perfect harmony that the earth was created. Man and woman came into being and for a time they even had the perfect relationship. But sadly that relationship was broken by their own actions. It put a barrier between them and God and cracks in the family unit began to open and the children of Adam and Eve suffered and their children and the children's children. Now our hearts are rightly stirred and distressed when we hear stories of neglect or abuse or of places where children are left orphaned. In Mozambique, where Susanna and I live, we've got to know a wonderful organisation called Tutela and I'm now a trustee. Tutela means guardianship 
and the aim of Tutela is to create families for abandoned and neglected children. In Mozambique there are so many children who are orphaned or abandoned and abused. In the city of Maputo where we live it's thought as many as 12% of children are orphaned. That's over one in ten children. Now the answer for far too long has been to put those children into institutionalised orphanages. Our friends Be Johnny and Becky worked there and despite all their best efforts it was clear that this was not the best place for children to grow up. And God gave Johnny and Becky a vision, a God-given vision to provide homes, real homes, homes with parents to care for children and families where they're valued by their adoptive mum and dad. Now one of these children is Isabella. She was born when her mother was a teenager. Her father abandoned her and her mum at the time of their birth. Isabella's mum later married another man, but this stepdad would abuse Isabella, Isabella when mum was not at home. Isabella ran away from home on many occasions to escape the trauma, but ended up in, sadly, other unhealthy environments. But Isabella's life was transformed when she was brought into a home of safety and belonging recently. She lives in a home with five other adopted siblings. She's got a mum and a dad who care for her. She's been adopted into a new, loving family. Her life is now not dictated by fear, but is one of love with a future. If we're distressed at these stories of the hurt and pain in this world, can I tell you God is far more distressed? He hates the fact that this happens in our world, and he also hates the fact that there is a broken relationship between the world and between him. The God who created us, our loving Heavenly Father, who knows us, who sees the hurt and pain, was not just moved by our situation, no, he took action. He did something extraordinary. The Father, in recognising our lostness, sent his best son, his only son, to rescue us and to bring us back home. God does so by adopting us into his forever home, into his forever family. Just like Isabella, we try to escape from the issues of life, but so often find ourselves ending up in unhealthy habits or environments that are not good for us. God wants us to discover that we don't need to run anywhere else but to him and to his family. Paul expresses it in this way. Being like children, you can run to the Father and cry, Abba, Father. Now, Abba is not just the name of a, of a successful pop group. Abba, in the Aramaic language Jesus used when he lived on earth, is a term of endearment, of affection, of childlike love towards a father. And Jesus used this, used this word himself. We too, as adopted sons and daughters, can cry Abba as an expression of confidence. We can delight in the nearness and loving care of our Heavenly Father. Our adoption into the family of God transforms our understanding of what it is to belong in a family. And that should transform so much of what we do. Can I give you just one practical example? It's around one of the most precious gifts that we've been given, the gift of prayer. How do you approach God in prayer? Do you pray as someone who knows that you've been adopted into his family? Do you approach your prayer life in the same way as a child, believing that every single issue that's on your heart and mind is an issue that your father wants to hear about? If there's one complaint my children level against me as a dad, is that I don't listen to them. The wonder of our Heavenly Father is that he's always attentive, he's always interested. More than anything else, he wants our relationship with him to be without barriers. He wants us to share every single aspect of our lives with him. He wants us to live and to pray in the spirit of love and not fear. Which leads me to my next point about adoption. Because adoption totally changes our relationship with fear. Do you recall what Paul says in verse 15? The spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Why does Paul use words like fear and slavery alongside this word of adoption? Well, slavery, the trade in slaves and the effects of slavery has been very much in our headlines in the, in the news these last few weeks. Slavery is evil. It robs you of your identity. Slavery is an abuse of the human person. My first introduction to slavery was just over 30 years ago. In my summer holiday as a student, I had the opportunity to go to Africa with Tear Fund to Ghana on the West Coast. The history of Ghana sadly includes the history of slavery. One day as a team, we traveled among, uh, along the coastline to a place called Elmina. And in this town is a fort. It was, for ever, it was for over a century a trading port. Up to a thousand male and 500 female uh, slaves were crammed into this dark, dingy place. There was no space to lie down, very little light, no water, no sanitation. They were held in shackles and chains until the ship arrived. And then they were herded one by one through a small slit called the door of no return onto a gangplank 
that took them to the bows of a ship which transported them to be resold the other side of the Atlantic. As I stood in that empty dungeon, half standing in the darkness and in the gloom, I could only begin to imagine the gut-wrenching fear of the people who were held there, held captive, in chains, in darkness, abused, wretched, dehumanised. Now whilst we may, might not physically be slaves, many of us are still slaves to fear. Fear that comes in many shapes and forms, the fear of not being good enough, the fear of not knowing whether you belong, the fear of whether you fit in or not, the fear of not knowing what the future holds, the list goes on and on. This fear enslaves us, it shackles us, it grips us, it can be overwhelming. And as Paul wrote to the Romans in the second half of the sentence, adoption into the family of God changes that. The spirit you received does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship. True adoption totally changes our relationship with fear because adoption is so very different to slavery. When those slaves eventually reached their destination, they were sold. They became the possession and property of a slave owner who bought them. They were treated as belonging to the slave owner and the owner could do whatever they wanted with their slave. The owner doesn't care about how the slave is treated and he uses fear to dominate the slave. But God claims us as his adopted children in love. A disciple of Jesus, John, wrote these words, there is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, for fear has nothing to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not been perfected in love. Fear does not care, it rules by punishment. Fear does not love, it seeks to dominate you. When somebody is adopted, their legal status changes, but not like a slave who's owned by a master. No, when a child is adopted, they're taken into a family because of love. It's not built on fear or a contract, but a loving relationship. The child is treated as a son, as a daughter that belongs to the family they're loved and cherished and cared for. As a child of God, we are liberated in the same way. We no longer act in fear. There's no need to ask, am I good enough? Do I fit in? Can I trust you? Whatever was in the past as a child of God, we can be confident that our relationship with him is driven only and purely by love and by his acceptance of us. In being a child of God, we find our home. We share equal status within that home with all the other family, all the other children. Paul himself says this in verses 16 and 17. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. If children, then heirs. Heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ. A slave has no rights, but the adopted child has equal standing with everybody else who is a child of, or in the family. It's astonishing that as children of God, we're not only heirs, but what Paul describes as co-heirs with God's Son, Jesus Christ. Which brings me to the third point. Not only does adoption change our relationship with family and changes our relationship with fear, but it also changes our relationship with the future. Have you ever been called out of the blue to be told that you've received an inheritance from a complete stranger? I can honestly say that I haven't. However, if you lived in Lisbon, the capital of Portugal in 2007, then you may very well have done. In that year, 70 people were contacted out of the blue after the death of an eccentric aristocrat. His name was Luis Carlos. And they were told that Luis Carlos had died and they were to share his estate on, a, on his death. What have they done to deserve such an inheritance? Nothing, apart from being listed in the telephone directory. 13 years before his death, Luis Carlos had chosen 70 people at random from a Lisbon telephone directory and had put them in the will. Those 70 had no idea they were due to inherit a fortune. In our adoption, Paul assures us that our inheritance rights don't come randomly as if we've been picked out of a directory. No, they come with our new status as adopted children and are guaranteed. Now, legal wills used to have seals on them to demonstrate that they had been made by the person who declared them. Now, Paul writes, the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. Our seal is written on our hearts by the Holy Spirit who dwells within us. The Spirit guarantees that our future, both now on earth and then in death, is totally secure. In fact, we, same this, we, we share the same inheritance as a king, King Jesus. We're counted as co-heirs of a king. It's an amazing fact that whilst everything really does belong to Christ, by grace we share in what is rightfully his right now. This means we can, this means we can talk freely with the Father because the Spirit guarantees it. We can be released from fear right now 
in the love of God because the Spirit guarantees it. We know that, our, that despite our earthly sufferings, we don't lose a promised eternal inheritance. And what an inheritance it is. In the last book of the Bible, Revelation, we're given in the very final two chapters a taste of what that might look like in a new heaven and a new earth. There is a promise that God will wipe away every tear, that will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain. And this is what it is said by the king who sits on the throne. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give water without cost from the spring of the water of life. Those who are victorious will inherit all of this and I will be their God and they will be my children. What a promise, what a future. God adopts us into a family, the church, where we live as co-heirs with the king, the one who has conquered death, the one who reigns as king. In a world that seems confused about what it means to be family, in a world that seems to be fearful of what might happen next, our adoption should give us confidence to live our lives free from fear and to live lives of celebration. If we've discovered this reality of adoption in that liberation, we must go and tell the world about it. So on Father's Day, whilst I do want to say thank you to my earthly father for all the things that he's done for me, I also want to say thank you to my father in heaven that I'm adopted into his family, adopted into the worldwide family of the church, a family that cares for me and for you, that I can be released from fear, that I don't need to know whether I'm good enough, but my heavenly father loves me more than ever I can ever imagine. It enables me to know that I have a future, a future which is better than I could ever ask or imagine. If you know this assurance, then remember to go to him today and say thank you, not just today, but every day as a child who would say thank you and celebrate it. And if you don't know that you're a child of God, then I, can I encourage you to make this discovery on this Father's Day. The one who created you, who knows you, who loves you so much that he sent his son to die for you, loves you so much that he wants you to know him now. Please do this. Please go and find him, discover him. It's a decision you'll never regret.